What's up, guys? Rick here with your betting and one and done preview for this week's Memorial. I'll be going over outright options through the tournament simulator. I'll be looking at head-to-head -head matchups and maybe providing some options for your one and done leagues. Uh, there is a live chat. Two of them, in fact, but the first one is Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time on the Rick Ryan Good YouTube channel. That's all things memorial, ownership, you know, whatever you want to talk about. And then 8.15 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday. That's the jock market power hour. That is stock market DFS. It is uh, a fantasy type that is blowing up. I'm enjoying it. There's a lot of money to be made. And that is a very critical time Wednesday evening when you can bid on your golfers. So join uh, join me for both of those. But for now, let's just let's jump right into this. The uh, the betting preview for this week's memorial. Here is the tournament simulator. So if you are new, uh, I've simulated the results of this tournament 1,000 times. I have uh, listed out the results and I've compared them to the odds. And we see if there's any value. And there's two names at the top. Um, I don't know if they should be surprising, but there's two guys who won my simulation uh, more than 10% of the time. Bryson DeChambeau won it 11.1% of the time. That was the most. Um, a couple of things to note here. Uh, the simulator loves a couple of things from Bryson. It loves volatility at upside, which Bryson certainly has. And it loves the idea that if this course is going to play difficult, if the rough is going to play long... If the fairways are getting smaller, that's the blueprint for Bryson. We saw it at API, the Arnold Palmer Invitation. We saw it at Bay Hill, and we saw it at Winged Foot. Uh, th those are the blueprints for courses that have success. And if you think about it, and, and here's here, here's what to think about, right? If you have very narrow fairways, uh, everyone is missing fairways. So now you're all playing out of the rough. And if the rough is very thick, it's difficult to advance it, very simply. And if Bryson is the strongest guy, if he's able to advance it out of the rough better than everybody else, and he's hitting it longer, and there's really no incentive to be in the fairway because nobody's in the fairway, that's the recipe for Bryson to win golf tournaments. And of course, with the renovations, and as the week goes on, we're going to get more information about the course, but if, if you start hearing things like narrow fairways, if you start hearing things like thick rough, Bryson DeChambeau would certainly be an option, and and just in terms of the actual acreage, so I went through and I looked at all the all the renovation notes and all that good stuff, uh, just in terms of acreage, the acreage of fairways went down, the acreage of, fair, of, of rough went up. Now, depending on where that's at, where, you know, in landing areas and things like that, um, it's going to play an impact, but just in general, there's less fairway and more rough on this course than there was a year ago. Uh, Jordan Spieth is second here, and this is just a, a sustained run of great play from Jordan Spieth. I have him winning this 10.9% of the time. Him and Bryson DeChambeau would both be great values because because the odds that you can get on them around 17, 18 to one in some places. Uh, DeChambeau, I see at 18 and a half on, uh, on, on draft Kings. I think he's kind of similar on William Hill as well. Uh, so you can kind of get these guys into the upper teens closer to the 20 number. And I have them winning this event more than anybody else. So of course they're going to be one of one of the best values. Uh, after that, Pretty stacked up behind them with, with Justin Thomas, John Rahm, and Roy McIlroy. No surprise there. I think Rahm is the guy that you probably want to point out. Unfortunately, he's the guy with the shortest odds. Uh, he is, uh, to me, one of the better players on difficult golf courses. When you start looking at his victory here last year, what he did at Olympia Fields, he had another good finish at uh, Torrey Pines. He's had a, He played well at the PGA Championship. It's just like it seems that difficult courses seem to bring out the best of John Rahm. He's able to hang. He's able to grind. Unfortunately, he is your favorite. He's 11 to 1 uh, in, in most places for this week. After the big names, uh, I think there's a couple of intriguing options. Tony Finau being one of them. And let me pull up uh, his holy grail here for a second and, and try to illustrate this. Finau went through this kind of mini slump here uh, around the match play and towards the Masters where he was losing strokes off the tee. And I probably came on here, I'm certain I did, and I said, wow, it's always a little troublesome when a guy loses his best weapon, right? I've said that countless times over the years, depending on which player it is, and I probably said it about Tony Finau. And I usually say something like, because I believe this, that it tends to take time to get that back. It is usually not a flip of the switch. Ricky Fowler's putting, Gary Woodland's, uh, ball striking. It usually takes time to come back. And we saw literally a trend of 
Okay, Finau was about average at the Wells Fargo Championship, slightly better than that off the tee at the PGA Championship, and then Charles Schwab Challenge, boom, right back to where we would expect him, gaining 3.7 strokes off the tee. So let's kind of assume he's patched that up, he's fixed it, he's back to being the Tony Finau that we know and love. Well, then you look at his approach game. Okay, he's always pretty good there, no no concerns. Uh, I'm going to skip around the green, and I'm going to look at putting. Well, putting is is the trouble spot for Tony, right? And he And he's been terrible over his last handful of starts uh that shouldn't be that much of a surprise he's gone through stretches like this before it it might keep him from winning uh but if he can put to a zero get some other things to go go right for him maybe he's in contention the one thing that i think people don't realize is he's been really good around the greens uh, in fact out of everybody's last 24 rounds uh tony finau's number one around the greens he's he's been phenomenal so I, I think he's close maybe he finds a magic putter for a day or two puts to a zero for the week and i think his number at 22 to one or i, I actually got it at 29 to one uh, at circa uh, is at least worth a sprinkle we've seen him play well on difficult golf courses before um after finau uh you know, I'm I'm happy to go back to Patrick Reed at 35 to one. You're getting a much better number on a guy who had an ugly missed cut. Uh, I think there's some really viable, and, and these guys I'm going to talk about for for one and done. So we don't need to talk about them too much. But like the Billy Horschel, uh, Keegan Bradley, uh, Charlie Hoffman's of the world, those guys, uh, Shane Lowry's, like these these are all guys that I would be targeting. So I'll talk about them more on the one and done side of this. So I'll just put a pin in it for now, and we'll take a peek at. Uh, some one and done, or excuse me, some head to head options for this week. Okay. So the William Hill has one that I'm, I'm dying to get a look at here. So it's John Rahm versus Jordan Spieth. And I have to assume that Spieth is going to be the favorite in this pretty significantly. If you look at the start, Oh, it is. He is not. How is that possible? What is my time? Oh, sorry. Cause I'm doing since the start of 2020. Okay. That makes sense. So here, here's what we're dealing with here. Uh, if you go longer term, so since the start of 2020, which is very long term, obviously we're at like 18 months now, uh, John Rahm by far the, the favorite to win this matchup, 78%. That's huge. But if you change this to more recent, which is what I've kind of been doing recently since the start of 2021, that gap is actually uh, much closer. Jordan Spieth becomes a 44% uh, dog here. And then if you go even a little bit more, I bet you this goes to Spieth here. If you go to February, wow, it's really not. This is surprising to me. When does Spieth become the, does Spieth ever become the favorite in this? I might be way off on this. Wow. Okay. So Rom is, is always uh, basically if you go to the last two months, Spieth becomes the favorite. I was expecting to see since the start of 2021, Jordan Spieth was going to be that guy. Now you have to remember. So the way that this calculates versus um, the way that like the Holy Grail would look at this, right? So so what you've probably heard me say a lot is you know, since the start of 2021, Jordan Spieth's been the best player. And that's true in measured rounds. Uh, this also takes into account unmeasured rounds too, right? So so rounds that you might have had at a major championship that that did not get, um, that don't have, you know, strokes gain approach, strokes gain around the green, for example. So this takes into account everything. I'm, color me shocked. I'm surprised. Uh, I, I, was ex I was expecting to see a different result. Now, William Hill has John Rahm as a major favorite, minus 150. I don't think I could get to that number. I was expecting to find Jordan Spieth, who's plus 120, as a favorite in some capacity over John Rahm. I could not find that. So this is going to have to be a no bet for me, but we just... That just blew my mind. I was setting, I was setting up a, a, a play there, and it, and it didn't happen. The other one that I'm dying to do, and again, we'll do since the start of 2021 is Morikawa versus Justin Thomas. Remember, these guys battled it out last year in a playoff at the Workday Charity Open. That was the other event that was held at the at, at Mirfield Village. So these two uh, certainly know each other well. Since the start of 2021, I have Colin Morikawa winning this 55% of the time, so his money line should be minus 122. He is minus 110. So is Justin Thomas. Uh, if we open this up a little bit further... Start going back into 2020 to about this time last year, Justin Thomas becomes the favorite. He's about 60%. So if you want to go a full year, JT is probably the bet. If you want to go a little bit shorter term, increase your volatility a little bit, Morikawa is probably the side that you would want here, although I don't think either of them are 
big enough to 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 be worth it. Let me see if I can find let me see if I can find one that is actually worth a wager here. Okay, this one might be one here. So I've got Patrick Cantlay versus Victor Hovland. Hovland minus 125, Cantlay plus 100. I have Hovland winning this about 58% of the time if we go with the 2021 model, uh, which would put him about minus 141, which is, uh, I think it's big enough to be able to bet. If we start to open this up a little bit, I imagine Cantlay is going to close the gap. He does a little bit. But Hovland stays the favorite for quite some time. Basically, until you get to January 1st, 2020, Hovland's the favorite, and he never really becomes a big underdog, which should be a testament to how well he's playing. What I like about Hovland, especially in uh, in matchups, is he's very solid. I think he's only missed one cut in his last, I don't, some, something crazy, 29 starts. Uh, he's got a lot of top 15s, a lot of top 20s. If you took, like, average finish of, you know, if you just gave me a guy every single week that was going to finish T... 18 that would win a lot of matchups it would win a lot of them um and and that's kind of what victor hovland does so uh you can argue about the upside even though he's won twice on tour but the the floor being so high is very is very valuable in these types of matchups Okay, one and done. Quick run good update. Uh, there were actually about 12 of you who had Jason Kokrak and got the 1.3 million. Oh, Fro, I know him. He got 1.3 million. Uh, Caster Joshua got 1.3 million, which moved him to the lead. 13.2 million. Graybo is in second. Nash the Flash is in third. Chappy Chaps is in fourth. And Ugri rounding out the top five. I'm right here in 21st. Uh, I gotta, I gotta make a move. I gotta get somebody. I had Matt Kuchar last week. That did not work. There were also plenty of Jordan Spieth owners and Charlie Hoffman owners along the way. So there was a decent bit of money to be made last week. So congratulations for this week. Uh, what are we doing? So I, I kind of mentioned it at the top. I think there's, uh, so, so you can go with the big names. I, I do believe that a lot of the win equity is, uh, up top here, which is, you know, Rom, Hovland, Tom, Thomas, Rory, all those guys. Uh, the, the concern is kind of this, right? The first year of this brand new reconstruction, uh, it's going to play different, right? It's going to play at least a little bit different. I think it's going to play hard. I think I think the new greens, those tend to be very firm. I think it's going to play difficult. And I think that kind of opens up a lot of different possibilities. And for me, the guys that um, I, I find I find pretty interesting, let's start with Shane Lowry. So again, if you're this is if you're trying to go further down the board here. Uh, Shane Lowry, we haven't seen him since the PGA Championship. He finished fourth there. He finished ninth at the RBC Heritage and eighth at the Players' Championship. That is all within his last six starts. So we've got uh, two of the most difficult events that we've played recently, Sawgrass and the Ocean Course. He's got top tens at both of those. The other thing that was kind of shocking to me is how good he has been um, on approach, right? I don't know what my feeling was around Shane Lowry that he was kind of this short game specialist. Uh, that that hasn't been the case. I don't know why I thought that. Seven consecutive events, he has gained strokes on approach. He was phenomenal off the tee at the PGA Championship. I do have questions about the putter, but that's not new with him. Uh, Lowry is very, very interesting, and I think he's live for a one and done option this week. Uh, I, I talk about Keegan Bradley all the time, so I'll go quickly on Keegan. He's laying the blueprint. I talk about it all the time. He's he's gaining a ton of strokes on approach every single week, as he has for the entirety of his career, and he has been much better with his putter. His last seven starts, he's gained, I believe, a combined, it's like two strokes putting, which sounds terrible. But when you realize in the seven events before that, he lost 25 strokes putting, so... Plus two versus minus 25, huge difference. And it's why he's popping up on a lot of leaderboards. I like him as a one and done option. And then Billy Horschel, who, you know, say what you will about his success recently, because it's kind of been in some weird events, right? He wins the match play, which you could argue if you make par on every hole in match play, you might win the thing. Um, he played well with Sam Burns at the Zurich Classic. And again, you could argue, well, that's a team event. Maybe Sam Burns carried him. We could have these arguments, but he's still playing good golf right now. 25th at the RBC Heritage. He had a top 25 at the PGA Championship. He finished 40th at the Charles Schwab. What he has also done is finish in the top 15 four times in his last six trips to um to Mirfield Village. So we've got a guy who's at least feeling good about himself, vibing right now, playing good golf, going back to a place that he's had a lot of success. So I think those are three very legitimate 
mid-tier options for your one and done this week, especially if you're trying to make up ground. I don't think they're going to be popular, or maybe you're trying to save some of these guys for a U.S. Open, which we have in two weeks, right? Like the the other thing is this: um, if if you're if you're near the top. If you're front, if you're front running, or maybe you just want to be a little bit contrarian and you're okay with this, you might consider burning John Rahm this week. Uh, th- this popped up at where else did this happen that we got this right? Um, was it Rory at Quail Hollow? It, it might have been Rory at Quail, Ho- Quail Hollow, where it was like if. If you're going to, you might as well use Rory right now instead of trying to save him for Kiowa because if he plays well at Wells Fargo, everybody's going to use him at Kiowa. Uh, and I think everyone, it, no matter how John Rom plays this week, everyone is going to want to use him at Tory. Uh, the most popular plays at Tory are going to be John Rom and Bryson DeChambeau, I assume, because Bryson's got the US Open thing going on. John Rom has had the great success at Tory Pines. So you could be the guy who. Burns John Rahm this week where he's a favorite, where he's also won before and not use him at the U.S. Open and use somebody else. I think it's an intriguing option. I think it's just, uh, which which to me, in one and done, the best thing you can do is be a little bit different. I don't think you need to be, like, if you're a little bit different every single week, I think that's a good strategy. I As opposed to being half the weeks being super chalky and you never really make up ground on anybody. Uh, and half the weeks being super contrarian where you have to kind of get lucky. I think the best strategy in one and done is to be a little bit different. Take take a look at the top five guys. Pick the one that you think is going to be the least owned. Just be a little bit different. Uh, play play your studs at WGCs instead of major championships. Just be a little bit different. That That to me is what I think the best strategy is. Let me know what you think. Let me know who you're playing in this week's one and done. You can tweet me at Rick Run Good, or you, of course, can leave a comment below. Uh, best of luck this week, and I'll talk to you guys soon.